Everywhere we go, it's sweet as blow. Sometimes you're down, you're feeling low. Get on the phone and call me, bro. I got a fishing pole, I got some bait, you know. I got fuel in the truck, I got a place we can go. Sweet as bro, sweet as bro. Everywhere we go, it's sweet as bro. Singing sweet as bro, sweet as bro. Everywhere we go, it's sweet as bro. Okay, bro. So you had a hard day. Well, who hasn't had a bad day before? I'm gonna help you. All you gotta do is sing this simple song. Open your mouth and breathe. If you don't breathe, you'll die. So breathe and sing. Say these simple words. And I don't care if you're singing in tune or how you sound. The most important thing is you're doing it. And as soon as you start doing it, you feel a whole lot better. So jump on a song and sing Sweet As Bro. Sweet As Bro. Sweet As Bro. Everywhere we go, it's Sweet As Bro. Singing Sweet As Bro. Sweet as bro, everywhere we go, it's sweet as bro. So hey, how was that, huh? Hey, come on, you're feeling better already, aren't you? You know you're feeling better. Don't give me that shitty look. Hey, you lift your head up. Tear into it one more time. I promise you, you'll feel a whole lot better. Here we go. Sweet as bro, sweet as bro, everywhere we go. Sweet as bro, singing sweet as bro, sweet as bro. Everywhere we go, it's sweet as bro. What I tell you, eh? look at that. You're now a box of fluffy ducks. And hey, the sun's come out. We're going fishing. If we catch something, that's just a bonus, bro. Tear into it. All right. Sweet as bro. Sweet as bro, everywhere we go, it's sweet as bro. Singing sweet as bro, sweet as bro, everywhere we go, it's sweet as bro. Sweet as bro, sweet as bro, everywhere we go, it's sweet as bro. Singing sweet as bro, sweet as bro. Everywhere we go, it's 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 sweet as bro. He's a filthy mangy mutt Rolls and rotten guts Still we call dog a man's best friend Well she's no pedigree She likes to drink where people poo and wait Still we call dog a man's best friend He dropped the tear on mother's roses To father's garden hoses Still we call dog a man's best friend he came from the poor side of town <laughs> He came from the bloody pound From the bloody pound <laughs> On sheep shit he likes to munch Then he'll spew it up and eat it up. for lunch He's still we call dog a man's best friend He'll look his bum and clean himself Then come and kiss you on the mouth Still we call dog a man's best friend When he wants to come inside and you let him in You can guarantee that he'll wanna go outside again If you yep. invite your boss for tea, sure he'll try and hump the knee. Still we call dog a man's best friend. 
When you dress for Eat down in your tidy drawers, he'll jump up with his muddy paws. Still we called all the man's best box. friend. Looks as guilty as sin when she takes a poo, but you do her on a public in front of you. Still we called all the man's best friend. Where you go? Where you go? But if you locked him in the boot of your car with your wife and went off and got drunk, who's gonna be the happiest to see you? Later on you get back and open the trunk. You'll stay loyal if you're rich or poor. Ugly as sin in your fuck and snore and that's why we call dog man. Not for you, okay? It's a Bruno. It's Bruno's blanket. It's from Anna Marie. Not for you. No, not for you. It's Bruno's blanket. Good boy. Hey guys, hope this video finds you all well. I'm out here on the old Bucket of Hairy Bums boat. She's made out of coldy and she's currently not going. But I've got to come out here and check, make sure the bilge pump's working because old boat's taking a lot of water. It's ticking over so she's pumping a bit of water out. But as beautiful as it is out here, you can probably sense my frustration. Technically, I'm not allowed to fish off this boat, yet I know this kahawai out there right now. I watched a shag come up with like some fish about this big in its mouth, and I've seen the splash of a kahawai. And I've got my rods there, and I could just flick it out and catch one. But rules are rules, and nobody's allowed to fish off boats right now. Even though this is fixed on a mooring, I am allowed to come out and check it as all boat owners are on moorings. It's part of maritime safety during lockdown, but that's all we can do. So I've come out, had a look at the, the bilge pump, checked the batteries charging okay on the solar panel. She's all good. And now I'm going back in again, and it feels odd. But I guess you guys also have a lot of things that you can't do. Other things maybe in the city, places you'd normally go to, gyms you go to, or bike rides you'd take your bike to the car. We're only allowed to go five in a 5k radius of our home, so it really limits to what you can do. So what I've been doing is I've been doing a lot of biking and a lot of running, but I know some of you are much worse off than me, so I won't grizzle about not being able to fish. I know a lot of you don't even have a boat, and this old boat, even though she's an old bloody, it's a very, very cheap boat. The last one was this big, I actually gave it away. Oh, gee, fish just jumped out here now. Oh, shit. Oh, man. It's frustrating. Oh shit. I nearly tripped over then. Life jacket's on. Man, it's frustrating. I just a really big car I just came up just then. In front of the boat. Oh, oh my prey driver's through the roof. I haven't been fishing for like since lockdown. Oh, it's frustrating. God. Yeah, I can imagine it's even harder for a lot of you guys. Anyway. I'm grateful that I've got this to come back to when uh, she's all over. This is a great place to, to fish off and take the young guys out. We have a lot of fun on it. Mm. Right, going to head on back and do my chores. Welcome to this vlog and we'll see you back at the farm. Daniel smashing out the garden. This is cabbage that I, I got some on special. As you can see they've, they've got holes in them. But that's not as bad. This row and I bought I bought this cloth to protect them from the sparrows and the pukekos and the rabbits but they're even worse than that so is that slugs can someone tell me because I don't know but I'm gonna have to replant those every plant looks like this now through the mesh you can see the leaves have been chewed right down the garlic I grew uh, full moon ago four weeks has come up there it goes there that's looking good nothing's eaten that but these guys here, they've been shredded. Look at it, it's absolutely shredded. There's not much on it. And under this I've planted daikon radishes, which we've been eating. These have gone well. This guy's just about ready for harvest. I think we can take this one. 
Yeah, that's good. It's a nice radish. These are really nice. The salad. Yeah, it's a beauty. They get bigger than that too, but I'll take that now. I have that tonight in the salad. I have them with salt sliced up. That's a beauty. Nothing's better than those. That's good. This garden here was an experiment. We just planted and left it. We didn't weed it or anything. This kale. And we've been eating the silver beet down there. And the cabbages. The cabbages never got very big. Maybe because they had to compete with the weeds. And also the slugs. Even without weeding it, although, we've actually taken quite a lot of food from it. We still do. We're still eating this kale regularly. My son grew this corn. And I think most of the corn right now is like just seeded. Look in here. These corns are actually living proof that we've got on top of the rat population here because we could never grow this a year ago. And I guess you could use this to, to plant out again. Am I right in saying? Would you plant those or not? I don't know. We're on to our second coffee of the day. Has it started to hit you yet? Yeah, oh yeah. Get the boost. <laughs> Woohoo! We're rubbing into it. So I put it out there to you guys about him being in the military or being a colour, professional colour, because I got him connected with one of my patrons who's a colour professional and he gave, we did an online meeting about the pros and cons of getting your firearms licence, getting all your kit and professionally controlling the biodiversity of game in New Zealand. Colours are employed by a private sector, by Department of Conservation, by Council, by all sorts of different people, whether you've got a, a rat population out of control or goats out of control or even deer out of control on a lot of farms back country. We talked about this this young man here and he said oh man I never knew there was such a thing I'd love to do something like that but he also wants to go in the military and I said it the other day I mentioned I I don't think the military bro I think you're better off being a colour and I got jumped on by quite a few of you military guys and I can understand that just for the record I wanted to be in the military I was a sea cadet when I was young and I wanted to go in the navy and I completely stuffed it up yeah by that and a number of other stupid dumbass things that dumbass kids do so and my father would have liked me to go to the military. He did. Dad loved. He loved his training. He he said he, when he got there, he thought he'd gone to heaven. He was a thing where he got up in the morning and he got to like go hard out and compete against all these other men. And back then, he was a strong man. I just angle this a bit more, bro. He was a. Uh, just gonna turn. He was a boxer. He was a wrestler. He was actually Mister Tahuna Nui because he did a lot of uh, physical. Uh, training as well. He, he was built like that. That's my dad. <laughs> I don't know what went wrong with me. I, I got the dregs of the genes. He was. He was a very strong man. So I said that I think you're better off doing a job where you're in control and you get yourself sorted. Once you get your firearms license, you get your truck and you start to get ahead like that, it can be a really rewarding job being a colour. I've done a lot of goat culling when I was younger. Well, not a lot compared to some guys. I did a short burst, which I really enjoyed. We're now talking about turning around the other way, getting the military first, getting your basic military training, learning discipline, which wouldn't hurt you. Yeah. Uh, sorry, no, nothing bad in intent no, there, but agree, you're no. not very disciplined. And getting sort of uh, those, all those things with your firearm, your gear. There's a lot of really good stuff they teach in the military and teaching you self-discipline is a real good one. So what do you guys think? Do you reckon he'd be better off to go in the military first and then become a colour? And... What's your reason for why you think it's better to do the military first? Let's hear that. Well, to me, it's something that you kind of have to do early on in your life. You can't really leave mm. it until later. Mm. I think it's better to do it when you're young. But with a, being a colour, I think it's better to transition over to... Oops. Oh. Hey, it's just turning to you automatically. We've got an automatic camera. Carry on, bro. Yeah, I think it's better to um, transition over to being a colour once you have all the firearms experience. You're more of a machine out in the bush or in the hills because of all the training you've done through the military. And... Yeah, it's just something that's more sustainable at the end of your um, military career. That's than, true. That's yeah. very true. Because otherwise, you know, you're kind of leaving it out. You don't want to have regrets of the past, like wishing you went in or you didn't. But Totally, bro. Totally. And i got a mate that actually was in East Timor as a sniper, sharpshooter. And he now is a professional with his own company working. He's actually working overseas right now. Done very well. So, yes, there's a lot of logic to that. You can gain a lot. What is the main draw for joining the military for you? What is it that makes you feel passionate about wanting to do this? Well, mainly it's just trying to find a mindset that um, you know, has always kind of been around because my brother's always pushed me towards the military. Um, mm -hmm. He's older than you? Yeah. And he's yep. in the military? Yeah, he's a lance corporal now. Cool. So, um, 
Cool. Yeah, I've always just had that kind of mindset, always had that drive towards it. And no matter what I do, I always kind of have that feeling that that's more of the place I need to be at this t point in time. Yeah. And I can't leave it any later. But he's been a big influencer um, in terms of my perspective on it. I think it's cool, but I'm also confused a little bit because you've got on your arm here the hermit. Oh, yeah. Tattooed, and you're very much just sort of like a the lone wolf. You are. You like being alone in your own space. In a military, you've got people around you all the time. How would you be with that? Um, I can work in a team pretty well, so right. I don't mind that. I know what I'm getting into. Like, Let's just yeah, say that. Yeah. Um, you just got to bear with it because there's a lot to learn. Like yeah. Even here, like maybe when I first came here, I was a little bit uncomfortable with um, doing certain jobs and all that. Yeah. But once you Cleaning are... up chicken poo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was one of the main ones. He, so. said, he said, I can't actually get down that low. I can't do that, but I, I, I just can't fit down there. Bullshit. I just don't want to get down there. <laughs> and watching him gut a pig with his gloves on. I've never seen that in my life before. Oh, yeah, I was just lazy to take them off, you know. <laughs> I don't want hey. blood on my hands. Hey, man, if you scared a bit of blood and you're a soldier, that ain't going to work. No, I don't mind it. You don't want to blow it? Okay, I'm giving you a hard time. Yeah. I have been given a hard time, but really, he's worked out really good. And also, you are a team player because you're working in a, a forestry gang and you're part of a team there and you're doing bloody good. So, yeah. that's good. Oh, thanks for sharing. No worries. I'm going to tell you guys a story now. It's a story that will give you an appreciation of how hard some people work. Let's go back to 1992. I'm in Dusseldorf. There's an escalator. I'm in the train station. It's 3 a.m. in the morning. I've got a train. It's coming at 6. I'm caught between trains, which are quite often was. And I'm watching a guy work on the escalator. He's got one hand's been cut off here. It's been amputated. He's lost that. And he's a black man. He's quite big. And he's cleaning with one hand. And he's working. He's got these big, dark rings under his eyes. He looks absolutely exhausted. But he's working very, very well. I'm watching this guy. I'm thinking, shit, man. Imagine doing that for a job. And... I was quite fixed on him, actually. I've just had this feeling I want to go and talk to him, but keep the distance, because that's how it is in Europe. You don't go up like you do here. G'day, mate, how you going? You sort of keep a distance. And I hadn't seen many black people either. Like, in South Island, New Zealand, it's there's we have a few mouldy, but not black. Like, this guy's almost purple black, you know what I'm saying? Mm, like, the yeah. colour of the skin. So I was kind of fascinated with that, too. And I sort of wonder, wonder how he lost his hand. He went over and sat down on a chair, put his gear, all his clean stuff, did something with his watch, sat back, and I watched him put his head down and fall straight to sleep. Boom. Just like instant, someone turned the thing off. And he slept. And 15 minutes later on the tee, he sort of woke up and looked around and got himself going, back into his cleaning again. I was thinking, should I get to go and talk to this guy and find out what the story is? Because it's like now 3, 15 a.m. in the morning, and it's him and me, and I'm watching him work, and I'm feeling bad like doing so. Go, go over and say, Hello? And I was wondering if he'd speak English or not, and he's good English, he goes, hello. And I said, what did you do there? And he said, I took my 15 minutes sleep, the only sleep I'll have today. <sighs> really? I thought I was doing it hard, staying awake in the train station, going from one town to the next. He then told me a story, because I asked him it. He worked in Burger King for eight hours a day. He worked in a video up or take, I think they call it in Germany. It's a place where you, because in those days you had, it's the 90s, you had those videos you hire out. He worked in that for eight hours a day. And the other eight hours, he worked in a train station cleaning. And that was the only place where there wasn't people, he did a night shift, where there wasn't people to bother. And we could generally, most of the time, get some sleep for that little bit of 15 minutes. And he worked six days a week. And on the seventh day, he slept. I was like, why the hell do you work so hard? What is this? He told me a story, he came back from Sierra Leone, where the country was... Absolute turmoil going on, mm -hmm. and a big thing was where people he'd been captured and he'd had his hand chopped off, and they chopped a lot of people's hands off in their feet. And we had refugees come here to Nelson. I remember one guy that came here had no hands. That was a horrible thing they'd do. A lot of people, and the same thing went on, went on in Rwanda. A million people killed over there in that genocide. A million people, and a lot of it was with machete. Yeah, and a lot of them also left terribly wounded. So he told me a story and his dream. His massive dream, and this is a really cool story I want to get to the end of it. His massive dream was to become a reporter and to report the atrocities and what was going on in his country. And he, and he needed to get a camera, like a really good camera. And back then, we're talking 30 years ago, you don't just, like today you buy a good camera, you can probably do it two weeks' wages. For him, it was like sending money to his family, surviving, and saving for this camera. And his whole goal was to become a reporter, to show the world what was going on in his country and report on it. 
in big big uh, magazines like National Geographic, Time, all the all the big ones, and that was his goal in life. It was his sole dream. And I said, well, that's sort of like a little bit like my dream. I always want to become a musician, and I really worked hard too. Now you think about this for a minute. He worked six days a week, and I said to him, well, what did you do on the seventh day? He said, I slept. I slept. I slept all day. The thing about this is you need to get sleep for a very important reason. So that you can go without food for a long time. For, for, for days, you can't go for sleep for very long at all. There were some hideous experiments done, and I think in Russia, someone told me where I think they got to 11 days. Oh, those, yeah, those yeah. horrible experiments, they don't want to talk about that. Well, this guy here was pushing it because he was going six days without, only getting 15 minutes sleep a day. I know a lot of the multi-sport um, racers that do these long things, they go like three or four days and five days with fuck all sleep. But So, in, in his seventh day of sleep. Now, why you need sleep is because the brain clears the plaque off while you sleep. It's a process that goes. It cleans, cleans the whole brain. And if you don't do that, you develop things like Alzheimer's, dementia. And I know for a fact because a lot of the places that I played music in uh, recently, I do voluntary work where I teach play the the old people uh, that have got dementia they create those places because you can play the same song three or four times and they <laughs> it's, it's true you get, if you've got a song you're learning you can do yeah. it again they forget you played it they're, they're still happy listening to it I shouldn't have probably said that never ending encore yeah but it's not an encore they're just sitting there listening but they do love music I've got another story one day I'll tell about that too a really cool story so those people are often nurses uh, policemen that have done a lot of night shift truck drivers and I talk to them, and a lot of them have deprived themselves of sleep through their work. You miss out on your vitamin D. A lot of companies today they give vitamin D3 to their workers at work night shift to help with that, to compensate. That was his story. And we had a long time talking, and I said goodbye to Algier Tan later on, and I carried on with my, my, my day. Anyway, a few years later, I don't know how many years it was, a few years later, I'm back in New Zealand, I'm at Shays Elko. It's a, it's a cafe, it's no longer, it used to be in Trafalgar Street here in Nelson, and I'm reading a paper, and I'm reading this article, article about uh, turmoil going on in Africa, and I'm not even thinking about El Tan at all, not, it's not even on my brain, I'm just reading it, and I'm looking at this, this article, and I'm reading the whole thing, and it's a really good article, it's about the refugees coming to Nelson, because we'd have a lot of refugees coming here, and you guessed who wrote it, what are the chances? What other chances? There was this photo in the bottom, and I didn't recognise him. The photo looked like a really old version of him. So he was old when I met him, but those years of working, and his name underneath, El Gitan. Yeah. He made it. He made it. What are the chances? Like, you think about the chance of that. It's pretty low, like. It's pretty, well, I guess because that, that was something which stuck out in my mind, but yeah. some people, man, when you think you've got a hard job and you've got to do two hours a day on the farm. <laughs> oh, that is a thing of beauty. You can see the moisture. It's been in the fridge for a while. I've just salted it both sides and taken it out to get to room temperature. And you can see the moisture that's come out with the salt. Don't you even think about it, Pace. Wasabi leaf, absolutely delicious in a salad. This is the second crop of lettuce off this plant, often known as seasonal salad. These go great in salad. All of these greens, and what we're after is some beetroot leaf. You can see the beetroot growing there, but we grow these for the leaves. Look at the size of these guys now, because we haven't harvested them. Look at these beautiful leaves off them, absolutely delicious in a salad. You want to come in the garden, Pace? No, mate. What the hell are you doing on there, eh? You're on the wrong side of the fence, mate. Are we going to catch you or not? You're going to play hard to get, are you? I know a little white dog would like to catch you. Yes, I do. Gotcha. No, don't you touch. You leave it. There we go, mate. You're right. You're okay. You're okay. You're okay. There you go. You're all good. You're okay. Ladies.
Righty, let's kick this meal in the guts. Pace is joining us for a while in the kitchen. Check out my first knife. This is a shin. It's from Mason Sparks, one of my patrons. And the second one's a Japanese 64 layers of Damascus steel. It's kind of fitting because I'm cutting up my Japanese radishes. That's daikon radishes. Give them a wash. There's lettuce out of the garden. Beautiful cherry bomb tomatoes. They explode like a bomb in your mouth. They're so sweet. Giving the old lettuce a bit of a chop with my special scissors so it's nice and nice and cut up there. As our pumpkin seeds into the pan, we're going to roast them for about two or three minutes with a bit of salt to our brown. Give our salad a nice nutty flavour taste. Smash them in when they're still hot. You get a sort of a sound. Beautiful. A bit of salt. There's our eggs. Running under cold water helps get the skins off a bit better, or the shells at least. And there's that beautiful knife again, slicing them up for my salad. Here's the back of the knife to move and give it a nice clean because I'm looking after it because it's new. I wonder how long that'll last for. Eggs into the salad just like that. Boom. Here's a nice ripe avocado. Will it be black on the inside? I hope not. And here we go. And the truth is going to be revealed right now. And oh, beautiful. I love them when they're like that, doesn't always happen. Cut it again, we're going to use half an avocado for this. Slice those ways on both of them, and then get your fingers on either side of the skin, and peel it back, and then just pop out like that. Too easy, and then smash that into your salad like so. None for you, mate. Going to put that in the fridge while we carry on with the rest of it. Beautiful mushrooms, going to cut them up as we've got some red onion and some garlic. Cut these suckers up with our knife again. Just cut so nice, butter in the pan, heat it up, give it a swirl around. Gonna smash some olive oil on top of that, give that a whirl around too, stops it from burning the olive oil and the butter together. Put our mushrooms in, gonna leave them in for about five minutes, and there goes our red onion. And I like cutting red onions up because I don't cry over it like I do with white onions. Traditionally, red onions are used more for like eating raw in a salad, but I like cooking with them too. Mushrooms looking good, onions in the pan, a bit of salt on top of that, swirl it round, and there's the cream, oh the cream. Gonna let that heat, very slow heat here now, not too hot, we don't wanna burn the cream, give it a mix up and let that reduce a little bit. Take it off, pan on for our steak. And the easiest way to deal to your garlic is just get your knife and smash the bastards like that, one after another, so the husks come off a much easier way than trying to cut it. You peel them off with your fingers very quick. Duck fat rendered down into the pan, one of my favourite fats for cooking with next to leaf lard. Get the old fan going because we're getting hot in the kitchen now, the pan's hot, we've got a bit of smoke going. We want it really hot for the steak. The steak's been laying around all day with salt on it and it's nice and ready, room temperature going in the pan, laying away from ourselves in the pan. Flip that sucker over. And cooking steak's a little bit like, oh, quite controversial. Some people say turn it twice. Some people like me will keep on turning the bastard. Keep even temperature on both sides. Don't forget to get the outside as well. And there's a bit of rosemary, gonna flip that round and give it a nice aroma. Oh, the smell of that garlic coming up now, just beautiful. Turn it over and keep on turning as well. I like to do it. It's uh, very controversial how you have your steak. Some people say, oh, I've got to have it blue. Others will say it's got to be like well done. Some will say, oh, it's going to be with the blood dripping out. It's a bit like how a bloke likes his woman. Everyone's got their own taste, and that's up to you, and it's personal, and it's nobody else's business how you have your steak. But I like mine rare, or basically medium rare here today. Introducing that back into our sauce with all that juice. Going to rest the steak for a good five minutes, even longer maybe, and then reheat our sauce up again, throwing some pepper in there, fresh pepper. We're putting that last because we don't want to burn the pepper. That's the last thing to go in. Give it a stir around in the pan. Oh man, that smells good. And look at the steak. Now we're gonna put that there and rest it on there for a bit longer and use the juice from the steak and reintroduce that into our sauce, that beautiful mushroom cream sauce. There goes our salad out of the fridge, nice and cool. Smash a, a lemon off the tree into it. Two halves, how easy is that? Just straight on top of it like that, boom. And then we want to get our extra virgin olive oil, but don't forget a pinch of salt on there first. Smash that over the top, oh man, that looks good. There's our sauce again, bit of a mix up. And I'm gonna chop the steak up so I can just sit back and eat it with a fork and look at that. Just bloody beautiful, nice scotch fillet. Oh man, mouth is watering at this stage. Look at that fat on the inside. Oh, who doesn't like steak? Well, I suppose vegans don't like it, vegetarians don't like it. More for us. Oh, look at that, there's our mushroom and cream sauce on top. Beautiful salad, getting ready to smash that down. That's, that looks so good. Oh, just hungry like looking at it. And I've already eaten it, I'm just narrating it again. I'm second time round, I'm still hungry looking at it. I'm salivating. Now this is, uh, unofficial cooking in my new kitchen, but as you can hear, the acoustics are shocking, so I've got a long way to go before I can fix that problem up. But, 
that won't change the, uh, the flavour or the taste. One of the things I've never liked about having a rest of steak is it loses its temperature. So the cool thing about making the sauce and putting it on the last minute is it reheats it and the steak is nice and rested and you can see, excuse fingers, you can see that it's not overdone, it's just perfect and it's got that nice sauce in it. I don't think there's anything more in the world that satiates you more than steak. <laughs> so good. Other than the avocado and the olive oil, everything that is out of the garden here, including the eggs. Fresh. Delicious. Mmm. Oh, I can't stop eating. Here's my favourite bit right here. Bits with fat on. I will take my time eating this. It'll take me probably close to 45 minutes chewing it and just enjoying it. Thank you for watching and I hope that uh, your cooking is going well, particularly if it's during lockdown and you're limited to what you could normally get. Like normally I'd have fresh fish this time of year, I'd be catching kakawai, but that's out. So just making the best of fresh vegetables and steak given to me by a good mate. Be good, if you can't be good, be careful and we'll see you in the next video. See you later. Such a simple dressing, just olive oil and lemon. It's great.